I know that some of you representing nations outside the European continent are preoccupied with many challenges, such as tackling the economic consequences of the pandemic or combating the effects of the climate crisis and soaring food and energy prices. I do not wish to give the impression that these challenges are in any way less significant than those in Europe. Nevertheless, I hope you will understand if I concentrate this evening on the war and the catastrophic humanitarian situation on our doorstep. You hardly need a reminder from me about the exceptional gravity of our current security situation. For all the optimistic assumptions we made are now called into question. Far from being eliminated, war has returned to Europe. Yet again, we are facing mass murder. Yet again, a ruler denies the principle of other nations' equal rights and even questions whether certain states should continue to exist. And yet again, some are attempting to recreate empires and spheres of influence. All this is known to you. So I would like to highlight certain aspects of the Ukraine crisis that deserve greater attention this evening. First is the fact that the community of Western and like-minded nations, which extends well beyond Europe, has risen magnificently to the challenge and has proven its resilience. Ukraine has succeeded in defending her independence because her courageous soldiers and citizens were sustained by support from many other nations worldwide. Millions of Ukrainian refugees were offered temporary homes throughout Europe without the requirements of immigration controls or other formalities. Romanians and other Europeans bordering Ukraine can now go about their daily lives freely because of the protection offered by the North Atlantic Alliance. One of the most powerful messages the Alliance ever adopted is the slogan, we are NATO. Indeed, we all are NATO, for the Alliance safeguards our independence and peaceful coexistence and existence itself. And where would we be without the European Union? It is the institution coordinating efforts to keep the war-torn Ukrainian economy afloat and the only body capable of managing the vast task of Ukraine's economic reconstruction when this war is over. Those who started this war believed that we were divided. We have proven them wrong. And that is a momentous achievement. My second observation is that as we stand up to aggression, the key institutions safeguarding our security and prosperity are also changing. Although most of the countries that used to be behind the Iron Curtain have been members of the EU and NATO for almost two decades now, for largely historical reasons, the centers of gravity of both institutions, their decision-making and preoccupations remain concentrated on the western part of the continent. The Ukraine war has now irrevocably shifted attention towards Central and Eastern Europe, partly because this is where the needs are greatest and our continent's future will be decided. This gravity shift is of historic proportions and significance, and one which we should welcome because it is an absolutely necessary adjustment, adjustment for both NATO and the European Union, an accommodation ensuring that these institutions represent a truly united continent. For Romania, and other key regional players, such as Poland, this transformation 
means that our voices will be better heard. But it also entails greater responsibilities in shaping and upholding a European consens consensus and contributing even more to continental security and stability. I'm proud of the role played by Romania in this process, including the recent hosting of the NATO ministerial meeting in Bucharest. And I'm sure that you will see the Central and Eastern Europeans expecting and exercising a much stronger voice when the debate about Ukraine's reconstruction will begin in earnest. I salute the decision to grant EU membership status to Ukraine and the Republic of Moldova. I know that this was not easy. I know that membership will not come soon and that much, very much, is expected from these two nations. Still, the acceptance of the principle that one day these two countries will join the EU is vital, not only for their security, but also for ours. Our eastern borders will not be peaceful unless these two nations are allowed to live in peace. And as we have all discovered from our own experience, these nations will not find peace unless they are part of our family. It's as simple as that. Recently, my husband and I visited the Republic of Moldova, and I can tell you without any reservation that the leaders in Chisinau are genuinely committed to European integration. However, they are battling daily against destabilization of efforts and sheer poverty. We can be sure that even if the Ukraine war ends soon, attempts to destabilize Moldova will paradoxically only increase. Ensuring that the Republic of Moldova remains firmly committed to her European integration policy is an inseparable part of ensuring that Ukraine prevails in her defenses. The two are sides of the same coin. And just as King Michael embarked decades ago on a campaign to persuade our partners that Romania's natural place was in NATO and in the EU, I am pledging myself today to do whatever is in my power to ensure that the Republic of Moldova succeeds in following the same integration path. I will also promote broader efforts to enhance Black Sea regional security by encouraging Georgia's integration efforts in the coming year. Dean of the Diplomatic Corps, Your Excellencies, I wish to repeat my personal appreciation to you, all of you, for your friendship and for your solidarity. I do believe that our continent will emerge from this war united and perhaps even strengthened in its determination to rebuff those who still think in terms of empires, client states, and spheres of influence. And I am convinced that we will take even greater comfort from our unity of purpose when we meet again a year from now. I wish you all the very best for the new year. Thank you.